Okay, so while we're waiting for the slides to come up, um, first of all, welcome to Mumbai. It's a wet Mumbai, as you realized, going up and down. It will be unfortunately wet for the next few days as well. Uh, so we'll do our best to keep you both uh, dry and busy in the lab. So. Um, I have this afternoon two things that I wish to cover in terms of talking about uh, programs and projects at Tata Center and while one of them will be a case study and that's the one that was introduced on cervical cancer. Obviously you may not be particularly interested in cervical cancer so the part that you pay attention to is the process. How did the whole program, it was not just a project, it became a program, it's still ongoing in fact. Uh, it's a, literally a five-year-old program of sorts that we undertook, funded through the data center. And it's an understanding at some level of how projects of a large nature with potentially large social impact can start in a university setting, which is the connection that you have to make. So for whatever it is that interests you later on in terms of your research themes and in terms of the local innovation activity that you want to undertake, the question is how do you kickstart it? What is the facilitation that you can get done inside? What are the things you must plan for? And what are the what, what is the evolution of such things as a program which you might see in your own colleges later on? And that's something which we need to have a conversation on. I'll try to bring out key points as I go along. but. Also at the end of the week, hopefully there'll be an opportunity where we can have a follow-up discussion on this, where you talk about your interests and we'll know that as part of the projects that you're going to participate in. in the, so that I understand that the lab staff will help you put together prototype solutions of various kinds. So in that process, we'll debate how some of your ideas can potentially actually be undertaken through, for example, uh, the TechWip program, program at your college, but how can you actually try to make a larger impact on your own? But before we talk about a specific project, the first part of the talk this afternoon is at a top level trying to understand what you're trying to do in terms of uh, solving things. Now, this actually is a very hard thing for most of us to do. The reason is, you're all, I'm guessing all of you are engineers. Is there anybody who's not an engineer here? from a science department or humanities, you're from chemistry. chemistry. We're all used to academic coursework of a certain kind. Most of you have done a project or the other as part of your master's, maybe a PhD, right? So you're already exposed to some academic research in, and, and you have already experienced an academic research culture. Can you think of innovations which have come out of academic research? Anything that you can remember from your departments, from wherever you studied, anything which has come out, anything which has translated? No, nothing, nothing's happened, nothing of interest really happening, academic research. No? Okay. Why is that? If nothing of interest came out, if nothing of social relevance came out, why do you think it's not happened? What prevents you from, in your departments, doing some research which has social impact? What do you think it is? You have some, yeah, you're synthesizing some materials, yes, sir, yes. potentially for sensors. Yes, like, uh, MRI <coughs> okay. Okay. Why? No, I understand. So it, it has not gone somewhere. But what prevents it? What prevented it from going somewhere? Okay. So time, funding. What else? There's something fundamentally wrong with what you just said. That is not to blame you. Everyone here is equally in a similar situation, and most of the research I've done also has gone nowhere. Okay. 
So the question, to, hard question to ask is, if you are trying to come into this kind of environment and learn about innovation, is what prevents you from innovating? So what is it? So if you go back to your experience, where you are working in a chemistry lab, I presume, on synthesizing <laughs> various materials, right? What prevented you from going forward? You are saying funding. Mm -hmm. I know that someone is working on that project, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't have that knowledge right now. You, you don't, so maybe something is going you're not involved in that project anymore. Mm -hmm. So I have already designed, fabricated, I have made enough Yes, but if you go back to that lab and you see what, what has happened since, maybe a few more papers have come out of that lab, right? Has it gone commercial yet? No, that's not Why? So if, if you are implying that more time spent at the project would have translated it and commercialized it, then the argument is wrong because whoever was the next postdoc failed to take it out as well. Maybe, uh, maybe sometimes we prepare molecules or prepare things, we think that it works well, but sometimes you know, you know, maybe some advanced uh, experiments they fail and we realize that okay, this is not actually good for real life study. Okay. A large part of that solution, the answer to that question, is actually on the slide. What what were you trying to solve? Right? What were you trying to solve? So it turns out we are in a cycle, we are in a rut where we do some kinds of research simply because it gets us a degree. The moment I put a constraint on you and say that your master's thesis must happen in one year's worth of work because the master's program is normally two years. So it will take you, let's say, one year, a one year project at most, and that too, the graduation date is defined well in advance. So your project must end on a date defined well in advance. It's next to impossible for you to innovate and come up with something practically useful when you already know that you're going to exit the system. Same thing would have happened to you as a postdoc. Funding was known to potentially dry up well in advance and. The moment you get into that mode, right? at this point you are just trying to maximize your personal benefit which is the number of papers published and if there is something simpler to do than to create a product, you will do that something simpler which in your case may be characterizing materials in terms of their properties, physical and chemical properties and just publishing and claiming an innovative material even though you actually never deployed it in a field trial of any kind and actually took it further towards the commercialization aspect. So, if we are locked into time scales of research in an academic setting where it turns out that you are unable to think of a long time frame, either because you yourself as a student or a postdoc had to graduate and move on, or your students who are currently working with you trying to do something, they have to graduate and move on, there is this continuity. Okay. Net result, we work on small, small, small problems which are guaranteed to complete in a one year time frame, maybe a two year time frame at worst. If it's a PhD student that you're working with, that could be a three year to four year time frame, but they're small problems. And because there's this pressure on you to wrap this project up and exit early, we end up doing some match fixing of this idea such that it's a low value idea guaranteed to get the student out of your system with minimal risk. In fact, if you think of the entire process of academic research, it involves how many entities? It involves a student, it involves a faculty member, but it also involves a sponsor. Somebody is funding this research. Who is this somebody? Let's say DST, DBT, MHRD, CSR, right? government agencies for the most part are funding research. Three entities, student, faculty member, and sponsor. Now sit and reason this out. How much innovative research has come out of DST funding? How many innovations can DST claim to commercialize? Right? Why? If there's nothing big that you can think of, why is that? The answer is similar to what we just explained, which is for every entity in this current research pipeline, there is no tolerance of risk. From a DST secretary perspective, if there's a program manager at DST who is funding a particular grant, uh, who's funding grants in a particular theme, okay, 
I'm a chemical engineer, so let's say chemical engineering. The DST program manager for chemical engineering, okay, if I go as, an, as a faculty member and say, just give me a big sum of money, I will sit in my lab for five years, I will do innovative research. In five years, I'll come back with a product and then you take credit for it because you funded it. Manager is going to laugh at because from his perspective, right, he's going to bet that I'll do nothing with the money. In fact, I'll probably waste the money. And then he'll be left with nothing to take credit for at the end. And when he has to go to his bosses and explain what he spent his money on, he'll have nothing to say. Right? So it's a risky thing for somebody to give me this money to do this kind of research. So what will the manager do? The manager would prefer to fund projects which are not innovative. But where he has something to say when it goes to his, when it go, when it comes to going to his boss and explaining what was the uh, uh, end use of that funding, so he'll say, "Look, I gave small amounts of money to so many labs, and they all published two papers each. Those two papers will end up with nothing practical. It's incremental research, right? But at least it's something for that program manager to say that two papers." were printed, were published, maybe one patent application was filed, not even granted, filed. And that becomes the yardstick by which that manager is claiming success at the DST level. So there's no tolerance for risk. From the faculty member's perspective, as I said, if I go up to DST and say, give me huge amounts of money for five years and I'll solve the problem of cancer, I'll be laughed at. Right? So the first time somebody laughs at me, what will I do? I have to go back. I need research funding. I'll have to go back again. This time, what kind of proposal will I write? A proposal which is guaranteed to give me two papers in three years because the DST funding cycle is three years. Right? Two papers in three years. And at this point, at least I can run a lab and at least I have some money to work with. Right? So at this point, I have no dreams about innovation anymore. Yeah? From the student's perspective, if I tell a potential student who's coming into my lab, just join my lab. We're going to solve cancer in five years from now. Right? You'll be famous. Well, that's great, but it's a risk for the student because at the end of five years, if you have done nothing, he might have nothing useful on his CV to take take forward next into a postdoc or even a faculty position somewhere. So instead, the safer thing for that PhD student to do is to join any lab which is churning out papers, if you think about it. So the student also potentially doesn't want risk. So fundamentally, we are starting in a system which is trying to avoid risk at every level. That's the point I'm trying to make. And it is against this background that we are about to start a conversation about how to innovate. So it's challenging. It's challenging because fundamentally, you're trying to do something which is not within the culture of your system. It's not even the culture strongly in an IIT system either. Leave alone any college you might be coming from. We are running this as a Tata Center workshop and Tata Center was a unique happening from an IIT Bombay perspective. I don't know how much of an introduction you have had to this in the morning, but let me recap a little bit about the center. The way the IITs are structured, and I'm sure the way your colleges as well are structured, is we have departments in conventional disciplines like chemical, mechanical, and electrical engineering. Right? We increasingly now have science departments. We have chemistry, physics, math, and biology. But over time, and of course, we are known because of the BTEC program, which requires intake in chemical, mechanical, electrical, aero, and so on, civil engineering. But over time, research interests have started changing. It's not just chemical, mechanical, and so on. So we started creating centers. Why, do, why does, if you st stop and think about it, why does an Indian Institute of Technology need a Tata Center for Technology? The truth is, it's been very hard for us to create innovative technology in our core departments. I'm going to talk about cervical cancer, but I'm a chemical engineer. And at first sight, there's no connection between chemical engineering and cervical cancer. 
it tells you that if you wish to cross over and try to crack a problem in a slightly different domain, it's very hard for you to do it in your parent department, right? Because you will have your workloads in your parent department. You're probably doing a lot of teaching. You're under pressure to execute projects with the students that you have and push them out with some degree or the other, bachelor's projects, master's projects. So if you're going to try to do something of, of especially of something of social impact, and social impact now doesn't say social impact using chemical engineering. That's kind of silly. If ultimately have to solve a problem, for example, in healthcare or water or energy or education, these are actually large problems. They are difficult problems. They involve many aspects to these problems. And you can't be saying, I'll come and solve this problem using one core engineering skill. And usually that one engineering skill is probably actually irrelevant. As it turns out, chemical engineering has ended up being irrelevant to the problem of cervical cancer. So our solution has been to create centers and within these centers we try to access students of various kinds, of various backgrounds, so that you can build teams which would have been very hard to do in your own parent department. Right? So I'm going to jump ahead and talk about our final slide in my cervical cancer presentation. But the team structure in that particular project involved mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, I needed a person with computer science background. I needed people. I needed programmers. I needed needed an Android developer. Okay. I needed clinicians on my team. Obviously, cervical cancer. So I need people with an understanding of medicine. Okay. I needed people with a sociology background. Why? Because at the end of the day, somebody has to go out and deal with a patient. And engineers are very bad at human-human interactions. Okay. So it literally needs a very interdisciplinary team. And one of the thoughts is, how do you create such platforms where you can build interdisciplinary teams? And if you are trying to do something more than just build a proof of concept, you're almost surely going to have to create a large team with different skill sets. And that's the key learning. In fact, that's what big companies do. Big companies have made various departments. And they obviously, from the top, the boss tells people from various departments, come together and crack this problem. It's very hard to do as an academic because you need access to different skill sets. So that's one. Okay, thought. The biggest problem we have had, even having created a platform like a data center trying to crack some of these problems, is trying to figure out what is it you are trying to solve, which is why this particular topic. What is it you are trying to solve? You, if you think about it, as somebody with a chemistry background, you are trying to showcase your smart synthesis of materials of various kinds. You are trying to prove that you are skilled at the task of synthesizing materials of various kinds. Notice that when you said what you were doing, the application came second. You talked about you talked about the synthesis of certain materials, and then you said for purposes of MRI contrast. Okay, the synthesis of MRI contrast reagents. What I want to say there is, you talked of a solution first, and then you told me about a problem. Do you see that? You talked of a solution first. And then almost as an afterthought, you try to say, here's an end use for that solution. That's the way most of us do research. So I'm not pointing you out just because you open your mouth. It's not fair that I jump on you. But that's the way most of us behave. That's why it turns out the hardest thing for us to do is to figure out what a need is. I'm not asking you what a problem is. What is a need? There's a difference between a need and a problem. What's that difference? What do you think is the difference between a need and a problem? You can think of any domain that interests you, whether it's healthcare or energy, water, education. Give me an example of a need and then give me an example of a problem. What do you think is a need? Fresh water is a need. Fresh water, having good quality drinking water is a need. What's a problem? Okay, now address that as an engineer. What is a problem that you will work on? Scarcity, you can do nothing about it just like that. So what is it you can do which converts it into an actual engineering action point? No, okay. So you're saying that there is uh, there's, uh, highly contaminated water? Yeah. 
Uh, that's a very interesting observation. That is one problem. Are there more problems with water itself? What is the need again? Availability. Availability. The, the need to be have drinking water. Okay. And one problem with this you are saying is the fact that contamination has to be dealt with. Okay. And is there any other problem you can think about? Well, that's contaminant. Okay. Okay, so continuity of access. In some ways, the scarcity indirectly addresses this. Okay. Would you say that both of these are engineering problems? It may not be your engineering background, but is it an, is it something engineers can contribute to? I, th I think they you want to, to ultimately capture. You have to store uh, for so that availability is ensured throughout oh, the year. That is a, a proposed Storage. solution. But my question to you is, is it an engineering kind of problem where engineers can get involved? You have to uh, some storage. Okay. Yeah. That is uh, related to engineering problem. No, con contamination is talked about. So yeah. the, contam the removal of contamination is an engineering challenge. Agreed. Yeah. But he is now talking about storage. Is that also an engineering challenge? Yeah, to some it's, extent. Okay. Anything else associated with water? How do you know where the water is? In terms of if I look at a map and use satellites, for example, as, as we have mapping all of this. How do I know where the water is and where I should? You talked about scarcity in one place versus another place, right? To even come up with an overview of where the water is and where I should send it, right, that's an engineering problem. I don't know what the technology is, but for the moment, I'm simply saying it's an engineering problem. What is the need again? We come back to that. What is the need? The need to have water. Making available water in right quantity at right Okay, you started elaborating on the need. Do you see? You you fit in every problem statement that you could find, and you're adding a word into the need statement, right? Why am I making a big fuss about need versus problem? What's the difference between a need and a problem? What all of us would have done as engineers in an academic world so is take on. Yes, they're different words, but in what in what yeah. sense? Why why should I differentiate? Why can't I simply say? Actually, need is anything which is required, which which is uh, required for our survival. But problem is uh, how to get uh, how to fulfill those things. It's also need, no? So, so uh, what what I'm trying to do Actually, is to need, need is of individual. No, I don't want to get into the politics of this. <laughs> okay, so where I was coming from this is the fact that a problem, in fact, as engineers, as people who have studied, as people who are teaching, how do you use the word problem? In a language sense, how do you use the word problem? Word problem. problem. It's a problem. There's an end of chapter collection of problems. Sorry? Mm -hmm. That's a problem. So there's a problem at the end of a chapter. Does it have a solution? Sometimes at the back of the book, there's a solution there. Right? So problems have solutions. Notice how the way we have been trained to think of the word problem is literally from a schooling perspective, a collection of problems, and there are solutions to these problems. Everything is a solved problem. You may not know the solution, which is why you look at the end of the book. And if you don't know the solution, maybe the instructor knows the solution. But the mentality is that these are all solvable problems. That these are all, if not by you, at least it's out there. Okay, So it's a technicality, but our usage of the word problem reflects the fact that you are being challenged about a small concept at a time, which is why it's in a particular chapter, and every chapter will have its collection of problems. 
and every problem immediately has a solution right if you were to think of societal problems in that fashion you would have you would have issues if you think of water scarcity in that way can it be an end of chapter question how will you deal with water scarcity how will you deal with the need to have clean drinking water you see that so i am deliberately drawing attention to the fact that a need is what connects with society okay and in fact i don't even want any discussion about solutions materials i don't want a discussion about solutions when i'm first trying to figure out what people need finding what people need is itself a hard thing to do why because if i am somebody building sensors the first thing i'll think about is somebody needing water needs my sensor which detects a contaminant but that may be the wrong problem to solve when there's a drought going on for example and people critically need to find how to take water from one place and pipe it to another place okay so the need from my perspective the way i visualize is a need is a big thing it's a top level challenge the need to have fair access to good quality drinking water at all times of year and so on that's a need that need as you pointed out one by one you came up with several aspects to this which are all engineering problem statements at some level the need to be able to detect contaminants in that water the need to filter out those contaminants the need to figure out at a top level where water is available and where it's not they need to plan in other words for okay they all become engineering problem statements because each of them will immediately have a precise engineering solution which will follow just like our end of chapter problems have precise engineering solutions so the mindset unfortunately most engineers are trained with is a problem statement is something somebody's predefined already for you a problem definition is given all the data you need is already out there and you just need to apply a, a, an appropriate procedure and arrive at the answer which will not work for most social impact problems why because invariably the problem definition has to be broadened to clarify what the true practical need is for an individual so it's critical to understand this okay now this in fact extrapolates from where we started which is our entire thought process as somebody on a very short research time cycle is to work the other way which is i'll create a solution i'll create some materials again to take your example i'll create a material which is a solution then i'll map a problem back to it and say for example mri contrast agents may be an appropriate use of these nanoparticles that i've just fabricated but who needs mri contrast agents where do i use it just because i made an mri contrast agent doesn't mean i've solved something in real in the real world who needs it maybe as part of a live surgery challenge where the doctor has to figure out what the boundary of a tumor is so yeah? let's say the cancer surgeon has to operate and remove a tumor and his challenge is while he's operating he needs to figure out whether he completely remove the tumor or not there he could potentially use the good mri contrast agent so that in real time he can figure out whether he is cutting out the right amount or whether he needs to cut out some more happens all the time with brain can brain tumors why because in a brain tumor you can't be sitting and doing all these um exper- all these diagnostics before and the only way for a doctor to function is to literally open you up and then figure out what is the size of the tumor where is the tumor what are the boundaries of the tumor and then actually plan the surgery in real time and that's what happens with brain tumors so there this method but do you notice that i went from a solution to a problem to a need which is entirely in reverse okay and at this point if it turns out the doctor doesn't care for these materials i've made i have a solution which is worthless why because i did not ask what is the need up front and then try to address that need precisely maybe the doctor has a cheaper way of figuring this out using some other fluorescent dyes and it doesn't need your nanoparticles so what is the need okay it turns out to understand a need especially for problems which have to do with social impact you have to spend time trying to understand people 
And that whole field of looking at people and the way they live is called ethnography. This is, in hindsight, for engineers, a very hard thing to do. The engineers have been asked to just stare at books and equations for the most part. And we have no training when it comes to social aspects of trying to figure out what goes on. In fact, the entire philosophy of engineering education and, for example, education in the uh, social sciences is quite different. In the social sciences, people are required to immerse themselves in that particular neighborhood where there's a problem and then live with them, for example, and then try to understand what, what's going on. Okay. So that, that's the way they function. Whereas engineers are supposed to sit and analyze things, build computational models, work out some abstract form of the problem in theory, and then attempt solutions. There's a big difference, therefore, in terms of mindsets as to how engineers don't intervene directly in a problem context, whereas people with a social science background actually first go into the context and then end up better defining problem statements. So it's a hard thing to do, okay, what, to figure out what people um, are doing, how they're living. When, for example, uh, we were looking at cervical cancer as a particular problem statement, this challenge came to us from Tata Memorial Hospital, which is in Parel. It's one of the top hospitals in the country. In fact, probably the best hospital for cancer in the country. And when we thought of cervical cancer, we always thought of a patient sitting in Tata Memorial who needs our solution. And at some point, we came to realize that that's not the solution. Why? Because at the end of the day, how many patients come to one hospital? And if you're building a technology, it should impact more people than mm -hmm. the ones who come to one hospital. And at this point, we realized we don't understand where, what, what, what happens to these patients in the interior. How do they live? How do I even identify cervical cancer early on in a woman who's living in a village? And what, what, what makes her want to come forward to be screened for cervical cancer? Why should a woman who for the moment is living her life relatively normally in a village be screened for cervical cancer when it could be bad news that she gets? Right? To understand her mindset, to understand whether she is willing to come forward for a screen and to understand what the pros and cons are of therefore us building a technology which might impact her life, people have to go into the village and live there and understand and talk to these women. You can't sit here and reason these things out. So that part is ethnography, which is moving out and trying to understand what the problem is. If you're telling me that there is contamination of water out there, sitting in an IIT, where we've got filtered water coming in from our lakes, and then uh, it is also potentially treated at our central treatment uh, plant. And of course, we are all sitting with echo guards in our houses, water filters of various kinds. Sitting here and trying to evaluate this problem is silly. When, for example, you walk into Bengal and Orissa and Bihar, and there the groundwater is contaminated to various levels with arsenic and other metals. And the impact that has on people's lives there is totally different from the pollutants we are likely to see here in Mumbai. Right? So, how do you look at the way people live? And one of the things, I mean, these are just a few guidelines for what happens when you try to scope out a problem, is you've got to not just randomly walk in there and try to ask, okay, what, what problems do you have? But you walk in there having done some preparation. Okay. How many of you have been part of an NSS kind of activity? You're all familiar with NSS, some social service kind of thing? Yeah. If you're not familiar, at least you know of it, hopefully, all of you. What do you think happens with an NSS activity? Students are usually sent out, they form clubs, the students are sent out. What happens? You're supposed to do some social service, but can you describe what happens when you do social service? You raised your hand. So. Do what? Okay. Why? Why that particular problem to solve? In the lab, only these type of problems are there during winter season. Okay. They are too cold and we give them some. Class you, you keep saying we. Who is we? How many people? How many people in your group? Uh, 
And they're all doing the same thing. Why? Are, why are you all doing the same thing? Sorry. This will be at two. We have been assigned there. So did you have a good time doing it? Did you have a good time doing that? Just to enjoy. So did you do this to help people or did you do this to enjoy? Actually, the answer is both probably. There's an element of wanting to do these things because it's part you're part of a gang and you're all in the same with the same attitude, you're going out and genuinely trying to help, but you're also trying to have a good time while helping. Because that in fact makes you more excited about the whole activity and encourages you to do more. Right? Is that fair? How come you didn't go somewhere else and try to find some other problem to solve? If it's the same challenge every year on <coughs> the Ganga, why not go somewhere else and solve something else? Okay, so now you're blaming the faculty members. <laughs> now you're blaming the faculty members. So take that one step further. What prevented the faculty members from assigning more challenging problems? Again. I don't mean to blame you. When a team from IIT Bombay, and we also have NSS and so on, when a team from IIT Bombay goes out, the first thing we do is we go out this Y point gate. We have a main gate and then we have a Y point gate. You get, a, get out of Y point gate and you do a U turn, you're in a slum. Right along a boundary wall, there's a slum. Will you find social problems in a slum? Yes, all kinds of problems. So the easiest thing for a team of our engineers to do is to find a problem literally next door. Right? Why next door? Well, it's convenient physically. Right? In fact, as it turns out, if you just walk further and further into that slum, there are all kinds of problems there. The slum is not one entity. The slum changes in terms of the people who live there and their problem sets. So up front, close to the main road, are the richer slum dwellers all the way at the back against Sanjay Gandhi Park are poorer people who have to deal with the leopards and so on that we have here. Right? So, and there's a gradation of problems, therefore, if you think about it. And our engineers, what do they do? They're lazy. So they step out and they solve the first problem they see. Again, notice that there's a dynamic where they're all happy about going out and contributing. That's good. But they stopped at the first problem that they saw. They stopped at the first problem. In fact, the attitude was walk into the first house and ask people, what, what problems do you have? And then you attempt to solve that immediate problem. Now, the reason I bring this example up is if we are in that mode of thinking that you will solve the problem that's closest to you, invariably you'll find that that solution interests only that one entity, that one household is going to benefit from your solution. But what you just did and you, if you think about it, you did something relatively rare. A bunch of kids with a lot of energy stepped out and tried to solve something. But the net achievement is that a very small segment of society benefits, that one household benefits. And the question to ask is, if you had wanted your intervention to scale in terms of impact, could you have done things differently? Could you have done things differently? If somebody was actually paying you to go out and solve problems, as opposed to you going out on your own time at your own cost as a club, or as a gang of students, if somebody was paying you to go out and solve this, the person paying you would not tolerate you saying that you solved only one household's problem. So how do you scale? How does an intervention scale? So notice that the right elements are there, people, motivation, intent, maybe even resources because they can come back in here. And many of our students go out and teach kids, for example. So resources, they bring them back onto campus and they teach these kids, school kids, some basic math and so on. So all of that is there. But if one IIT student is just teaching five kids math, how does that scale? How does the impact scale? Okay. So one of the reasons we spend time trying to figure out what a need is 
and spending time talking to a large segment of the community about what's going on is because we are judging to see what's a need and that too what's a big need. What's a need where if you now spend your time trying to solve it, you're going to have a big impact. And that's a critical thing. Why? Again, because we are most of the time in a hurry to quickly demonstrate some local impact by doing some small project. That NSS team, which had, which was going to be together for one year, was under pressure to quickly show some impact. Right? And of course, the thing about NSS is batch after batch of students will come. But batch after batch will still go to the first household they find. The net result, our efforts do not scale. One of the reasons you therefore read and try to figure out what's going on when you, when you, when you go in, into a particular neighborhood is to ask the question, what is the collection of potential problems people have? What are the underlying need statements that govern these problems that people have? And now which of them deserves to be worked on? And here let me tell you a personal story about how I got into healthcare as a chemical engineer. So about five years back, IIT Bombay decided to get into healthcare research and for which purpose? Because we don't have a medical college on campus, we are an engineering institute, right? The thing to do was for us to go to all the major hospitals in the city and ask them, what problems do you have? What, is, what technologies do you need? And we wanted one wish list of technologies. And I was a coordinator for this activity and the idea was to talk to a range of doctors and a range of hospitals, collect a wish list, bring them back to campus and then show faculty and student teams here this wish list and ask them to start working on these things. We now think of it as a thrust area on campus, healthcare research. And it needed, because we are starting from nothing, we needed somebody going out and collecting those wish list. Here's an interesting thing which happened. Every single doctor I met had a problem or two. When you say problem or two, obviously, they're struggling with patient loads and they want technologies which will allow them to handle patient loads better and better and faster and faster. And for that matter, with less expenditure, with less expense. And so they all came up, they all had ready-made problem statements which they had been struggling with for a while. And some of them had even tried to solve them on their own, trying to do some Jugad engineering on their own. Why? Because nobody else was solving their problems. So they all tried this. And when I walked in, just boom, they hit me with a big list. In hindsight, that was a good thing to happen. Because when I ended up, I had a list of a spreadsheet of 100 problems. Why is it a good thing? Because if somebody expects you to solve 100 problems, you obviously cannot solve 100 problems. I don't have the funding, I don't have the manpower, I cannot crack 100 problems. But the good thing is, I sit and ask, which of the 100 should I solve? Of the 100, because I was given a challenge of so many need statements, because I was given a challenge of so many need statements, you ask the question, which one deserves to be solved? Not every problem is equally worthy of being solved. Every one of them is a problem for some doctor or the other. That's not a, I'm not, I'm not denying that. But the question is one of scale. And especially if, the, if you are being expected to invest our money in doing research to solve somebody's problem, why am I solving a problem for a few households? Why am I not solving a problem for a thousand households, for 10,000 households? Where is that scale? So one of the things you do when you go out is observe, watch, record all that's going on and create a large list of challenges. That challenge statement might be in engineering, might be in the arts, might be about finance. Okay? These may be problems in education, healthcare, energy, water, food, but you document all of them. And then you come back and ask, what will you solve? Because if I'm finally solving something for five people, it's not definitely not worth it. Because you can do better in terms of scale. Right? As I'll point out to you later, this whole process of doctors talking to me and my talking to the doctor is a conversation which must be carefully controlled. Why? Because it turns out, as I said, doctors have many things bothering them. So they are very quick to tell you which problems they want you to solve. But they are also very quick to tell you how to solve them. They will suggest the solution. They just want you to build the solution for them. 
invariably that's ended up being the wrong thing to do. The solution that they suggest ends up being the wrong solution. So there's no shortcut to this thinking process. There's no shortcut to this thinking process. And what we have learned is rather than rush into engineering anything, if you take your time out and you talk about need finding and you do this systematically, right? If you are convinced at the end of a long process of figuring out needs that indeed this is the need to solve, very likely by the way, somebody else with funding is also going to be convinced that this is indeed something that needs to be solved. And at this point, the various elements of your solution will come together. What you do not want to do is to go up to somebody and say, what problem should I solve for you? Okay, because they'll tell you stuff. You start, even if they tell you stuff, it's for you to decide whether that's genuinely something to be solved or not. That's the point I'm trying to say. You don't take, if I, if I listen to every doctor at face value, I would have ended up with 100 things to do and that too potentially in the wrong order. It's turned out to be important that we ask the same question sometimes at different settings. You walk into interior Maharashtra now, malaria is huge in, when it comes to healthcare. Okay? You walk in at the end of November and December, malaria is not huge. Viral infections will be huge. So whenever you are proposing a solution, the need, that need for that solution might itself change over time. If you think of agriculture, okay, and we have seen this in Maharashtra, okay, there are, there are um, you know, weeks where uh, tomatoes are super expensive and there are other times of year where tomatoes are at dirt cheap prices and farmers are struggling. So, if you happen to go into a neighborhood once and you ask a question, what, what, what are the challenges with the dealing with tomatoes, you might end up getting the wrong perspective on that as a theme itself, as a challenge itself. So it's something where you go periodically and try to assess the genuine need. Okay. So the recommendation we now have is when you go out, you don't try to get people to tell you what what you think. See, the, the, the trick in some ways is to prevent people from trying to tell you stuff that they think connects with you. Because everyone's trying to get you to work on your problem. They'll say things that they want you to hear, thinking that will convince you to work on your problem. So avoid that. You just take notes, come back, debate, and then collectively reason out what's worthy of being solved and what's not worthy of being solved. And that's the way we have started, at least in my group, research group, we have started doing things. Okay. Prioritize. Ideally, you are starting with 100 problems, prioritize them and then ask the question, which ones will you start working on? And one last point I am going to throw on this slide, you have to worry about ethics. For example, many teams from this IIT have gone into interior Maharashtra and have talked to farmers who have been struggling. You know that there are many farmer suicides, for example, in Maharashtra. At this point, there's teams which just want to go in there and understand what 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 is your um, finance status like, how are you earning, what are you spending your money on, and so on. And poor people in particular who are desperate for a solution are open with all their details. Now you've got to maintain some confidentiality about their details. Just because you're poor doesn't mean you can go and publish their finances and make that information available to all because that information can be abused by the way. Right? Just like you would hate for your all your personal details to be shared online with everybody else. People you are going and surveying also have rights. And again, engineers usually have a very poor understanding of ethics when it comes to these things. I don't mean it in a bad way. It's just that we are not exposed to dealing with people. And we are seeing this start to hurt, especially with social media and the technologies you are seeing in social media. The lack of ethics with the way interactions happen on social media shows the whole culture of how communications happen on social media is not the way it happens, for example, face to face. So now let's get into the specifics of this new statement. So where, where I will end up with this particular presentation is for whatever it is that you ultimately wish to work, I'm going to point out that you need a very precise document that you will write up, which clarifies what is it that you're trying to solve in society. And it requires actually precision in thinking of, of various types. So we'll st steadily put together that document. And hopefully as you now think through both your data center small project 
which you're all going to be work on this week, but also with all the pet things that you want to work on. You're all here because hopefully you want to solve some, some particular kind of problem, maybe in your own settings in your colleges. How will you start drafting what you want to do this is where I will end up with this. Something which is unique to us as innovators is we are actually talking at two extremes to two sets of people. On the one hand, we have to talk to people in society and figure out what exactly they need solved. So going into that neighborhood and trying to figure out what to solve, that's obviously at one end. So that bottom of pyramid stakeholder understanding. But if the idea is to create a technology, then you will be under a different pressure. Because to make sure this technology finally benefits that person, I have to manufacture my technology at scale. I can't sit in a research lab and say I created a technology. I can't dream like that. You talked of a material. Will somebody will have to manufacture this MRA contrast reagent at scale. Who is going to do that? Right? And unless you manufacture, people will not receive the benefit of all your R&D. So somebody, some investor, let us say, therefore has to become interested in your solution along the way. And so you're talking at two extremes, trying to figure out in society who's going to benefit. At the other extreme, somebody who's going to actually finance you, taking your research out of a lab and taking it all the way to market. So that must happen. And the quicker you start on both, obviously you need to talk to stakeholders, the bottom of the pyramid stakeholders right from the beginning. But the quicker you talk to an investor, almost surely the higher the chances of you pushing your technology out. <coughs> It turns out having a very precise statement okay, explaining what's going on in terms of a challenge is, is what's required. So I say here a very crisp statement of a need statement. Okay. By the way, my entire presentation will not talk of solutions at all. Okay, And that's deliberate. I want you to understand, until a need statement is properly defined, so do you remember what I asked you about water? I asked you what the need was. Do you still remember that need statement? What is the need statement with water? You want, you want to have drinkable water. But associated with that need statement, we had many problem statements. There were engineering problem statements. Do you remember them still? Okay. And associated with each problem, engineering problem statement, there's a solution. In fact, there could be many potential solutions for the same problem statement. There may be many ways to crack a particular problem. Right? And it's for, for us ultimately to judge and find which one. So out of all of this need, problem, solution, I'm only interested in the need. Because if your need definition is wrong, then you're probably working on the wrong problems in the first place. And your solutions are probably useless. Okay. So the challenge is how do you precisely define a need statement? And something critical in here is that you don't bring in a solution in the first place. So if you remember, we started off by talking of a solution. Now there's a dynamic to this, which is any most of us who are doing research in a particular area, the first thing we'll try and do is to ask, how does my skill set solve that particular problem? So if it's water, how do how do I as a chemical engineer solve the water problem? Or how do I as a civil engineer solve the water problem? But a water problem is a water problem. That need cannot differentiate. The person who has that particular need could care less whether you are a civil engineer or a mechanical engineer or a chemical engineer. Or for that matter, whether you're a microbiologist, doesn't even have to be an engineer, right? So there's a tendency for us to fit ourselves into the solution process, into solving a particular need. I have a beautiful example for this, which happened to me in my own lab, in terms of a research project with the Hinduja Hospital, which is a high-end hospital in Mumbai. And as I went through this process of documenting all the challenges that doctors had, the head of the blood bank came to me with an engineering problem. By the way, my lab, the name of the lab says Protein Engineering Lab. And this guy knew about, knew about that. So he came all the way to my lab. He met me. And he basically said, look, I've got this problem which affects my blood bank, but it also affects every blood bank. So you might want to come up with a solution. And his problem was that it's very hard sometimes to find blood of a particular type in an emergency setting because then you're hunting for donors to be brought in. You remember there are four types of blood, A, B, A, B and O. So occasionally they run out of one type of blood. Which of the four types of blood is most convenient? O. 
Well, it depends on perspective, right? So, if you are a recipient, if you are an AB, any type is fine. So, think about it. <laughs> if you have to give somebody a unit of blood, then O is the safest thing to give. And so, sometimes there is an excessive demand for O type. In Bombay, we have got other subtypes as well. There is something called the Bombay subtype of blood and that is an even bigger, bigger challenge, sourcing that kind of blood and stocking it. So his idea was, look, is there some way in which you can permanently convert any type of blood into O type and just store everything as O. And at this point, this shortage of O has bothered him so much, he has gone online and he's read stuff. And somewhere in some biochemical engineering paper, it says that it is theoretically possible to interconvert A or B into O. It's a chemical reaction process at the end of the day. So let me quickly tell you what that basic thing is. Blood, among other things, has red blood cells. Red blood cells have proteins on them. Okay, on the cell surface, there are lots of proteins. And on top of these proteins, there tend to be sugar molecules of various kinds loaded on top. And the sugars can be of different types. So when you have a sugar of a particular type, it's type A. When you have a different sugar, it's type B. If you have both sugars, then it is AB. And if you don't have either sugar, it's O. And our immune system recognizes these sugar types and we build immunity for a, we, we essentially prefer a particular type of sugar on proteins, on blood cells. Right? And that's the biochemistry behind this. How did the sugar end up on the protein? It's a chemical reaction where the sugars are synthesized in your blood and loaded onto certain groups on protein surfaces. It's a chemical reaction. In the body, chemical reactions are catalyzed by enzymes, proteins which are called enzymes. They catalyze, that's enough from our perspective to understand. Now here's the thing, reactions are reversible. So if an enzyme can load a sugar onto a protein, an enzyme under the right conditions can also remove that sugar from a protein, which means if something created type A blood by loading a particular sugar, in theory I can remove that sugar and interconvert A to O. So that's the theory. Okay, And there are enough demonstrations of this research-wise in the literature where people have found such enzymes capable of adding sugar, removing sugar. So this guy now remember, what is the nameplate on my door? It says protein engineering lab. So he makes the connection. Enzymes are proteins. Can I create a cartridge full of enzyme where I put in one bag and one bag usually has 400 ml of blood. Can I put in one bag of type A blood and by the time it comes out of the cartridge, all the sugars are been removed. By enzymes which are immobilized inside my cartridge. So the guys even conceptualized the solution and it's come to me. Okay? It's a brilliant idea on the face of it because if I have a cartridge in an emergency, I can take any blood and without thinking about it, I can just ram one, one quantum of blood, 400 ml of blood and I collect it out as type O. That doesn't mean that the engineering is easy, the engineering is challenging. You have to make this enzyme, you have to put it in there, you have to make sure nothing else contaminates the blood which is coming out. I don't want traces of enzymes and stuff ending up in the bloodstream later on, right? But in theory, it can be done. And we got so excited, we actually started working on this problem. And then we found out it's a hard problem to solve. Why this enzyme is expensive. And slowly it dawns on us that to create this cartridge reactor, it's a reactor because I'm converting type A to type O. To create this cartridge reactor might cost us 10,000 rupees per cartridge. And who's going to pay for one unit of blood, one bag of blood which has now become type O, who's going to pay 10,000 bucks for one bag of type O? So there's no market for it. In an extreme emergency, fine. You need a bag of blood in space, fine. You have no other option. You can't find a donor in space. What is the problem with this thinking? 
What is the problem with this example? So we were guilty of something. It turns out we were guilty of something, <coughs> and that's again on the board. What are we guilty of? The user not only defined a problem for us, he defined a need, he defined a problem, he defined a solution, and just asked us to execute. And because we were engineers, all excited to showcase our skill <coughs> with that particular kind of engineering, we actually fell for that. And we tried to engineer a solution, which in hindsight now seems so impractical. If we had done a few calculations, okay, you would have told us that it was never going to be cost effective. It is never going to be practical. By the way, we didn't even ask the question, what purity must I get for O-type blood? Because if I have even 1% of the blood unconverted, there's trouble by the time I transfuse it into a patient. The patient's going to have a huge reaction to it and will potentially die. So what is that conversion efficiency we didn't even know? We just jumped into solving a problem and then, no surprise, all that engineering effort is wasted. Because there is no practical solution which will ever come out. But somebody told us the solution. Is there any, that implies, your statement implies, if somebody gave us a solution, it kind of implies as a corollary, corollary that there is an alternate solution. You agree? If somebody gives us a solution, that statement only matters if it's possible to come up with different ways of solving it. Is there a different way to solve this problem? Distribution is the problem. We want the availability of all kind of groups. So what is the need statement? What is the need statement here? To make available any required uh, type of blood to the patient. So the need, the need, whose need is this? Is it the blood bank's need or is it the patient's need? It's the patient's need. So what is the need? Make available a particular type The right type of blood. Okay. And quickly and cheap and all that, yeah? okay? So fine, so that's the need. Is there a problem statement here? So I've, I've come up with these layers, no? Need, problem, solution. What is the potential problem statement? Patient should have quick access to the, their type of blood. Yeah, so that's the need. What's the engineering problem statement? from the blood bank manager's perspective, what is the problem statement? To provide the blood. Must be able to quickly provide that blood. Okay. Okay. Which domains of engineering, science or arts comes into play? Distribution. It's a distribution problem. It's an operations, research, logistics kind of problem. Management? Management of what? Of the blood bank? Yeah. So indirectly it comes in. Yeah. Hmm? Management. What else? So it's logistics at some way. Yeah. What else? So you're not saying biochemistry anymore? Yeah. <coughs> if it's not biochemistry, I'm out of a job, right? So I'm not part of the solution. Because we already told out. Sure. We rolled out. <laughs> what else? Which other domain? First of all, uh, that information availability through the internet. You are going on to the internet. Okay. First of all, if it is uh, possible to avoid uh, such situation when yeah, that too, everyone should stay home and be healthy, right? You don't need blood transfusion. Um, it's, uh, it's too late for that. Let's say somebody is in no, an accident, no. then now it's it, or it can be planned. I mean, suppose operation is there, then agree. But let's say it's an emergency of some kind. Yeah, and which can be a traffic accident yeah. of some kind. Mm -hmm. So that's a back background to this. Yeah. In fact, that's the actual precise context we were told. In an emergency, interior location, yeah. okay, no access to a lab to even do the typing of blood, very quickly you need to do this. So one thing is that making donors available. Making donors available, fine. How do you make donors available? So again, which, which domain problems? I'm trying to slot it, right? So that's a typical mentality. Am I relevant to the solution process? Yeah. At this point, we have agreed that biochemists so are probably... There should be alone. some uh, database of uh, donors yeah. and their phone numbers. Through app, we registered some donors. Okay. And suppose we need some specific kind of blood group. 
Okay. We can put it on that. So we are all already hooked on to doing everything using apps. So now find a donor. Yeah. Yeah, that's really hard. That's a biochemistry problem again, and that turns out to be really hard for a variety of reasons um, because they have a natural turnover of cells in your body itself, and these cells they form. They fractionate and separate different uh, components, but in this case, you have to give whole blood. So even if it's been stored separately, you'll have to blend it together and feed it back in. Okay, that's done because, for example, dengue needs platelets, and you know. Cancer patients might need cells of a particular type, and anemia patients need a, a RBCs and so on. That's why they do it. But yeah, you, you're trying to. So you want to do stuff using the internet at this point. What are, what else? Is that it? I just have an app and I publish whether a donor is available or not. Is that enough? In theory, a Facebook plugin where I inform you of my particular blood type should do the trick, right? But I could be in the other end of the world if I'm on Facebook. So how does it help me? I need I need a unit of blood fast. So how do I solve this? There is one. All over there, he's got it. Yeah. What is the thing about all over? Yes, that you use some platform. And uh, on which uh, map uh, while logging, logging into the app, geographical okay. mapping of the uh, accident place is there and the nearest donor uh, location of that. But all I would do just in um, that's a Google Maps problem. Yeah, I just, I just so, put some tokens. But so, it's more so than that. So that uh, the donor can uh, quickly travel to uh, where is the hospital. But a donor no. is unlikely to be randomly visiting this web page. No, no, through, through, his, through his mobile, uh, mobile. Yes, but, but think through this. You are on the right track, but yeah, think through this. Through mobile. It's unlikely well, that you are randomly visiting. Through mobile. mobile no, I agree. So we are on a mobile platform now. Yeah. Okay, no more biology. We are on yeah. a mobile platform. Mobile platform. And um, you are proposing to figure out a way in which to inform people about an accident which has happened so that you can quickly identify people with compatible blood types. But that's not the end of the story, right? What happens in Anola? They have to motivate. Yeah, what is we the have motivation? to motivate them the uh, so that they come fast. What is the motivation? It's money. money. Think about it. If it's possible for me to negotiate a taxi ride, and that too with differential pricing, right? So Russia, all kinds of pricing, right? So if I can negotiate a taxi ride and go from one place to another, I can do this using technology. I can essentially negotiate a similar transaction for purchasing a unit of blood from somebody else who is compatible purchasing and I can even pay that person, I don't expect donations of blood, I can even pay them and I can pay them as a function of what I am willing to pay. So I can actually work out a business model here. In fact, this is bartering of stuff of a certain kind. Give me your blood, I will give you digitally some money. And it's a transaction where I can actually negotiate the rate of that particular service that I'm seeking. You see that? That's exactly what you do for a taxi. Maybe that is not ethical. It's perfectly ethical. Nothing wrong with it. Why? 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 So you're addicted to getting free stuff that you now don't want to pay for. <laughs> okay, a unit of blood. So, perfectly ethical. Then that creates another. The question is whether there are professional people selling yeah. their blood. That, so that, but that is again a technology challenge, which where you can lock somebody out of giving. Yeah. You expect that, right? So if somebody is given blood, then you can't give blood again within a certain window of time. So that's that's also solvable. But you notice how this became an entirely a discussion of an online, okay, IT solution, with a oh, economic aspect to it, a finance because there's a small digital transaction which must happen. That seemed to solve the blood bank problem. Never mind the fact that. It was originally defined as a biology problem. You see this? This insight which you came up with was brought up by an Android programmer in my lab. So an interesting insight here, which is different people in my lab looking at the same problem and approaching it totally differently. Whereas if I had simply been as a chemical engineer, asking this question of how does a biochemical engineer and 
as a technicality, I'm somebody called a biochemical engineer. How would I have approached this problem? I'd have tried to create this cartridge reactor. When, because I was doing some other work, which involved having Android programmers with me, we got to the point where the Android programmer was trying to find a way to fit into this. He wants to be a part of this club. He also wants some excitement. So he's the one proposing that this can be entirely cracked using an IT solution. Now we go online, it turns out other people have tried to create this kind of a platform. So it's already a solved problem. So there was no need for us to do this cartridge building. So that's an important model. Okay. There are two different, in fact, there are two important models here. One is just because somebody told us to build something doesn't mean you jump into doing it. You have to go, you have to go back and ask, could this problem be cracked? Is it the right definition of a problem? Is it the right definition of a need in the first place? Is it the right engineering version of a problem statement? And given a problem statement, is this the right solution? Right? You go back to water. A need statement might end up with multiple problems that you can work on. There are multiple things. We talked about pollution, we talked about water availability. There are multiple things you can work on for the same need. Unless you address all of them, the need is probably not going to be solved. So you have to ask which problem or which problems you're going to work on. Then for each problem, there are multiple possible solutions. We talked of enzymes, we talked about IT. There are multiple ways to crack this. Which solution will we work on? A second example on this, again, based on some work we did in the lab. We, have, we pushed a team out into Gachiroli, which is at the other end of Maharashtra, in the middle of the country. And there's a lot of malaria there. 13% of the population has already experienced malaria in that district. So, this administration is desperate. How do you bring down the incidence of malaria? Because life outcomes are very poor once you've gotten malaria. So the need is do something to reduce the incidence of malaria. What are the problems associated with this? What problems, how, how do I convert it into problem statements where in theory I can now define a line of attack where I can execute some, some research. If you simply say solve malaria, that's hard. Now how do I break it down into multiple problems? What, what, what is it you can do? Control mosquitoes, figure out a way to control. Well, that's again control of mosquitoes, it's related to that. So at a top level, figure out ways to control the spread of mosquitoes. What else? Diagnose. Diagnose. Figure out diagnosis, quick diagnosis, quick cheap diagnosis. What else? Okay, figure out the availability of medications and figure out a way to not just make the medications, but make sure that people have rapid access. Yeah, what else? Is that it? Okay, as it turns out, I'll put up a slide later on and we'll come back to this. So that, administering the medicine. Yeah, so making medicines available will involve not just fabricating the medicines, but finding a way to push it into people. And, but are these medicines once I have a disease? Are we talking about medicines once I've gotten the disease? Uh, only after getting the report of diagnosis. Okay. Can I have preventive stuff? Malaria? Okay. Should I be planning research on vaccines, for example? Hmm? Vaccines. Hmm. Malaria vaccines. Right? Do you see that that's a line of attack? Once and for all, vaccinate people. We don't see polio is a related kind of challenge and polio has gone away because of a vaccine campaign. Maybe that solves the problem. Right? So do you see that the top level challenge deal with malaria now has so many potential themes which you can work on and each of them will require a particular skill set. In fact, it may require multiple skill sets. Okay, we have talked about uh, prevention. So take up prevention. How would you prevent? So you want, well, we wanted to control mosquitoes. So let's take that up. How do you control mosquito? mosquito populations. So now I'm getting into the solutions, solution layer, need, problem, solution. How will you control being bitten by mosquitoes? Okay, so, okay, so some fumigation solution. 
Okay. What is? Yeah. So that's a detail. That's a precise solution detail of the fact that I'm spraying kerosene on ponds. But what else? Okay. So he's going into now fish, which will eat up eat up what? Mosquito larvae. Okay. Is that it? Fish? You want creams? You want repellent creams? Okay. Fine. What are what else? Nets, mosquito nets, to prevent being bitten in the first place. All right. So these are all multiple ways of cracking the same problem, right? And they all need different engineering. If you're going to build these solutions, they would have required different engineering efforts. Actually, it depends on you want short-term solution. I want a permanent solution. Why? I don't care about. I'm not worried about trying to prevent one mosquito biting me. No. So now you want to kill the mosquito. And eradicate it. The larvae. The plasmodium parasite. You want to kill the parasite. Well, nature is a little smarter than us when it comes to evolving these parasites. So it's unlikely you'll permanently get rid of the parasite. It's older than humanity. I don't know if you know this. Malaria is known in every other animal species as well. It's not just humans who get malaria. Mice get malaria. Okay, monkeys get money. We think it's been eradicated. It's not gone. It's still in there, hmm? out there in nature. In fact, one of the worst things to fear with global warming is that all the frozen land, Siberia, all of that, that's going to warm up, and all these things which are locked in the soil will come back up. So you'll see all these infectious diseases coming back. So anyway, so we have described so many different ways of just controlling mosquitoes. Everything was tried in Gacharoli, nothing worked. Nothing worked. Thirteen percent government has spent huge amounts of money trying to deal with this. Mosquito bed nets. Who lives in Gacharoli? Mostly tribals. They don't use bed nets. Tribal prefers to sleep outdoors next to an open fire at night, and they feel suffocated if they are under a net. So culturally, they will never. Use a net. In fact, every mosquito bed net given to a tribal ended up as a fishing net. Gatchiroli. So that didn't work. You want to give them odomos? How much odomos can you give them? <laughs> These guys are roaming through jungles all the time. Okay. In fact, that's the other problem, which is because they want a relatively quick, free lifestyle. They're not even fully clothed. Which means they are being bitten all the time. It was stunning to see these huts. They don't believe in windows and doors. How do you keep mosquitoes out if there are no windows and doors? There is no crime. That's why there is no windows and doors. Right? But the other problem is, how do you keep the mosquitoes out? There are no windows and doors. So do you see this? There is a strong cultural, social aspect influencing what's going on. And if you sat, sat here and you just debated whether to build a better vaccine or a better mosquito net, it's totally irrelevant because unless you understand what those people are living through and what their tolerance is for a particular technology, your solution is totally useless. When I put up that slide on ethnography, that's what it takes. You go in there, you spend time, you talk to people, you understand what they want to do, the way they want to live. And your technology better adapt to the way they are living, not the other way around. They should not adapt to your technology. So none of these things has worked. You know, you're talking about spraying kerosene. Spraying kerosene on what? They are growing rice. The fields are flooded. You can't be now spraying kerosene all over the paddy field, right? So that doesn't work. What else? Fish? Where will you put the fish? In the paddy fields? Ponds. People have come up with genetically modified bacteria which will kill the larvae. But there is no permission in the country to go around spraying genetically modified bacteria. And by the way, we don't know what else it kills other than mosquitoes. Which means there could be a huge ecological damage <coughs> problem caused by where you randomly spraying stuff. So that's not going to be kind of approved anytime soon as a technology. So there are challenges.
to this. It's not a straightforward problem. Okay. In our brainstorming, again, this example of an engineer trying to figure out how to be relevant to this. So there was a mechanical engineer as part of our team. How does this mechanical engineer solve the malaria problem? He says, when people are sleeping at night, I'll fire a laser and I'll shoot down every mosquito in the immediate region. Around. Okay. And our reactions are exactly this. The first reaction is to laugh. But here's something that's important again. Rather than discourage that mechanical engineer from coming up with this idea, encourage him. Because this solution, while it may not end up being a winning solution, at least it's a different line of thought. And may actually be, at some point, a winning solution. If the person will not wear a cream, if the person will not use a bed net, maybe I can keep a gadget next to me when I'm sleeping, and maybe it will kill mosquitoes within a defined region. So maybe. So that idea is worthy of discussion. It's not something to be thrown out just like that. But do you also see something important again, second time now? First time was with blood bank, second time now with malaria. Brainstorming with a range of people with different backgrounds is really important. Because if there's one person doing thinking about what to solve, what the need is, what a potential solution might be, your knowledge is so limited and your interest set is so limited that you'll probably not stumble upon the right solution at all. So to do this in as diverse a setting as possible with as many people sitting around with different backgrounds and this is a problem we have because in engineering the way we teach classes Every student is more or less the same background when you're teaching a team of people. When you see people doing lab work, when you see people doing project work in a lab, they're all the same background. And we have this dynamic where, you know, in a team of four people, one person is doing work and the other three are doing nothing, right? And other people are doing nothing either because you're not interested or because there isn't enough work for them to do because the one person who's doing it is doing it all. So how do you get everybody to contribute? They only contribute if they've got different skill sets, which allows them to be busy doing their parts of the problem. So one of the reasons we needed a Tata Center was to create an interdisciplinary club of people in teams. Because if I tried to do the same thing in one engineering department, you would struggle to find students with different skill sets. So something important long term, how do you create clubs with different backgrounds in your colleges? And how do you leverage that? Because unless you have access to different skill sets, you're very limited at the beginning itself. You can already predict that most of what you do will end up not going anywhere. Okay, now coming back to this aspect of writing uh, a statement. We are very casual about formulating this. And I, I've asked you now, at this point, many times, what is the need statement associated with water so let me ask you one more time, one last time. What is the need statement with water? No, no. Formulate that as a sentence, not a phrase. Big challenge. Make sure every household has access to. Per person, wow. Mm. In Mumbai, I don't think you get that. <laughs> okay, but do you notice that every time I've asked you, the wording has changed? I don't know if you noticed it. But the wording keeps changing. And the wording cannot change. Once you're on the right thing, the wording should not be changing this much. So it's a hard thing for us because why? We, we, we tend to be casual about how we talk it out. We tend to be casual about how we formulate this. That's part of the problem. That's part of the problem both in terms of our thinking about how to be precise about what needs to be done. And that's because we are not very precise about what to solve in the first place. That's one thing. Second, if there is lack of clarity in how we speak, then why do you expect an investor to come and fund us? Because if you're not clear about what you're planning on solving, 
any investor will gauge and judge and say that the money that they're going to give you is probably going to be wasted. Clarity in terms of a statement. Right? So when Modi comes up with some phrase just before an election, it's a very precise statement, right? As a sales pitch for his party. And every now every political party tries to do the same thing. But they're marketing, it's a marketing trick, but it's a very precise statement. And a lot of effort, I'm sure, has gone into figuring out the precise wording of that statement. And every word there potentially matters. So, can you draft something where every word in your needs statement turns out to be important? Ask the question. Don't simply randomly say it as you, as you speak it out. If you are intending to convince me that this is something to work on, can you justify every single word in your statement? Turns out to be a hard thing to do. So you are very casual with how you write. It cannot be a broad problem statement. No, I can't say I will solve malaria. That's too broad. It cannot be too narrow either. You cannot say I will solve malaria using lasers. That's too narrow. Okay. So somewhere in between is a more appropriate drafting or that statement. So that's something to think about. And one of the reasons I'm spending so much time on this is clarifying your thought process in what you want to solve will actually make the solution process very easy. Engineers have been taught how to come up with solutions for problems all along. So that's not the hard part for us. In fact, if you think about it, how many students have ever gone out and tried to find a need statement and tried to build a problem statement? How many of us try to construct our own problems? You see it? Because everything we have done in school and college has been somebody else giving us a problem statement. So the problem statement already exists. And what is expected of us is find a solution to that problem statement. And usually there is sufficient data hidden somewhere in the problem or the other available to solve the problem. If you were to ask somebody to construct their own problem, people will struggle. And one step back, trying to construct a need statement, that's even more difficult for many of us. So can you construct an appropriate statement where every word is justified? So when you later on, at the end of this week, when you're putting together your prototypes, your prototypes you're putting together because you're probably planning on solving something, right? I would love to see a need statement on one slide. On one slide, just tell me what it is you're going to do. And at that point ask, is every word needed in that statement? And the sharper that statement is, the more convinced I am that what you're doing is going to have value. Okay. So in now trying to understand what happens, you've got to read up on everything associated with this. So if you're planning on going into Gacchiroli and solving the problem of malaria, this cannot be like your NSS walk into the first house in that village and then what problem do you have? You can't be that wide open. You have to do some, actually do some reading, background reading. What, what happens in Gacchiroli? What is the politics of Gacchiroli? Gacchiroli is where Naxalite trouble happens. You see a problem there. The fact that there is Naxalite trouble invariably means the government cannot go in and do stuff. So there will be constraints on how you will roll out your solution down the road. And you have to find a workaround for that. You have to build that into your solution. Find a way for your solution to be deployable. Right? So the background reading of, of all that goes on. Okay? What else happens in Kachiruli? It's not, not just malaria. Sickle cell disease. It turns out the only way to avoid getting malaria, the only natural way of generating some immunity, is by having your red blood cells sickle. In fact, nature has selected for sickle cell disease in people who are otherwise going to get malaria. And when your red blood cells get sickled, it's your hemoglobin which is aggregating and sickling the shape of the cell instead of being a circular cell, it's sickled. Now what happens is your ability to capture oxygen is limited, which means your quality of life is very poor. You're struggling to work hard and so on. So now you choose either your malaria or you will not get malaria, but you're not getting enough oxygen for day to day function and you have issues leading a healthy, productive life. 
and whether it is India or whether it's Africa, people who are living in zones where there's high levels of malaria seem to have a very high level of sickle cell disease as well. And that's not, in hindsight, it's not a surprise. Both diseases have co-evolved. Okay. So what goes on there? What else goes on there? So it turns out that oral cancer is crazy. Why is oral cancer very high there? People are chewing tobacco. Not smoking it, they're chewing it. Okay, what can you do about that? Then now that's a whole challenge itself, right? So why are people chewing tobacco? There's a lot of alcohol abuse as well. So why are people chewing tobacco and drinking lots of alcohol? Okay. The rest of the country also could potentially be doing it. Why is it high there? It turns out there's nothing else to do in life. There's no phone connectivity, there's no TV signal. There's no entertainment. One of the reasons they chew is because it dulls your senses. And when the farmers in the village whole day, I mean in the farm whole day, it's a hard life without entertainment. So right? now there's a problem, which is even if I come up with a grand solution for oral cancer, I need to find a substitute for the fact that what tobacco is actually fundamentally doing is not even a bio biological thing. What it's doing is preventing the farmer from aspiring for other things. He's just numbing himself because he's trying to deal with his boredom. So unless I find some other addiction for the farmer, he will not stop chewing tobacco. And that's literally that. So at this point, that's not even an engineering problem. Do you see that? But oral cancer is huge. Okay. And that influences what goes on there. So what is the paying capacity of somebody who is spending all his money trying to buy tobacco and everyone chews tobacco, women, men, even kids, even kids, even school kids, they have done surveys, everyone's addicted to it. So if everyone's doing this, then and all your money is being spent on buying tobacco, the amount spent on tobacco is something like 10 times the amount spent on healthcare in Gachirodi. Then why do you expect people to buy your solution for malaria? And that's a purchasing power kind of thing. So when you're looking at markets and you're looking at customers, who's going to purchase your solution? Nobody. So these are all factors. If you have not understood that, then when you walk in there and you say, here's my new solution for malaria, who cares? So one of the things starting to happen with innovation is everyone's building a solution without understanding the context of what, what is happening. They're walking into a particular place saying, let me do a trial and fine. So after you walk away from that place, life goes back to the way it was before. Your technology doesn't seem to change one thing. And a large reason why nothing's changing is because people are not understanding the true needs in a given setting. When I say need, it is not just an engineering need. It is a fundamental challenge of what needs solving in the context in which it has to be solved. Solving malaria in Mumbai is totally different from solving malaria in Gachiburi. So you have to read, read up on all the things going on in that particular neighborhood, read up on all the solutions available. It's not that people have not tried, people have tried things, you need to go and find out what people have done. And in some ways you, have, you should not be repeating those mistakes. Right? Identify everyone relevant to this, identify every stakeholder, consumers, there will be local technologies. Right? Why local technology? I'll give you an example. MIT, which also has a Tata Center, one of its innovations was a wheelchair which could be built in a village. And the trick here was to make sure that every component in that wheelchair was made from some cycle part. Use bicycle components to make a wheelchair. Why? Because there will always be one bicycle repair shop, which means you'll have the spare parts to fix your wheelchair. So it is smart thinking in its own way. So involve a local technologist. We have a program out of IIT Bombay which is trying to build solar lamps and distribute them to kids. And again there, is there somebody local who can repair a lamp? There's no point giving away solar lamps if finally that when, when it breaks down, people have to ship it back to IIT Bombay to get it repaired. Totally useless. Right? Who are the officials? Who are the administrators? There was a large malnutrition program which was underway in Raigad district, which is in Maharashtra. And 
you know, I know that most of the kids in rural areas are malnourished. If you look at the government statistics, very few kids are malnourished. Right? Why is that? In fact, if you look at government statistics, things are improving with time. And why? Because there's a dynamic where government officials, one, one year if there's such a percentage of malnourished kids, next year it cannot get worse. You cannot, the official cannot acknowledge that it got worse. Things can only get better every year. So it gets locked into that model where you fudge the data and report wrong data. And the result is this massive underreporting of malnutrition. Now this is important because uh, an NGO which went into Raigad tried to deal with malnutrition by first surveying the incidence of malnutrition and they came up with the right percentage which was much higher than what the government was reporting. And they didn't think this through. Now what, what do you think would happen if you went and reported that the percentage of malnutrition is higher than what the government is doing? At this point the government rather than helping you will start fighting you, saying that your numbers are wrong. Is the net result that this NGO couldn't deploy its solution. It had a better solution, offering therapeutic food, which would prevent malnutrition. But it got into fights with local administrators. And the next result, nothing happened. Same thing with tobacco. There are enough politicians in Gachiroli who are benefiting by the sale of tobacco. And if you simply go in there and start screaming that tobacco causes oral cancer, you're taking away their business. Right? So engineering solution must actually work around these people as well. Find a way to work around people as well. Okay. Um, are there any market dynamics? Are you putting somebody out of business? Is your solution going to put somebody out of business? Then they are going to not be happy that you just came up with an innovation. Right? So worry about that. Will people spend on your solution? You didn't want blood transactions, right? So you're talking about transfusions of blood, units of blood, and we basically said that you have an expectation that blood be donated for free. You're so used to Lands Club, Rotary Club, blood donation drives. Out here, we have got political parties which run blood donation drives, all for free. So who is it will pay for a bag of blood? When MIT came up with this wheelchair, which was manufacturable in villages, who finally bought a wheelchair? Who do you think finally bought a wheelchair? How many wheelchairs did you finally sell? What's the number? What's the guess? The answer is easy, zero. How come they didn't sell a wheelchair? Because it's, on the face of it, it's a great idea. By the way, their design also was, rather than rolling the wheel, use levers to propel yourself forward. And that's a more energy efficient way of doing it. So you just push a lever and you keep pushing it like a crank. And that's a faster way to do it. Especially if you're trying to go uphill or on some bumpy village road. But they never sold these wheelchairs. Why? Because they didn't do any market analysis. Who buys a wheelchair in India? Have you ever heard of anybody buying a wheelchair? Any relative of yours, any anybody you know? Anybody bought a wheelchair? No? No? One. I've got one person saying yes. You don't buy wheelchairs. Why? If you wait long enough, Lands Club will have a drive to give away wheelchairs. Rotary Club will have a drive. And you expect to be gifted a wheelchair for free. In fact, the person who needs a wheelchair probably has no ability to influence the purchase of a wheelchair. It's a relative who decides if money is to be spent on you. And that relative is more likely to say, let's wait for a free wheelchair. Okay. So will you spend? Will you spend on a technology just because the technology is created? That's a surprise. Okay. Tata Nano itself as an innovation. What happened to the Nano? It went away. Why? On the face of it, it's the cheapest car around. So how come people didn't buy it? So it's a car. So they should have then gone ahead. No, everyone riding a scooter should have shifted to a car. So what he's saying is that people didn't want it because it was cheap. So 
So the marketing was all wrong. It was marketed as a, an ultra cheap car when people want a premium. I don't want a Geo phone. I really want an iPhone. It's all about marketing. What happened to Tata Swatch? Do we have a lecture on Tata Swatch later on? No? No. So what happened to Tata Swatch, which was a water filter that Tata Chemicals came up with? It's not in the market anymore. What it was was, rather than use electricity, it was a water filter which used a, a layer of nanoparticles with silver on it, which is capable of disinfecting any water in it. And of course, like any candle filter, it would filter out impurities first and then kill off any bacteria in the water. And you just, it's gravity. You didn't need electricity, you didn't need pumps, nothing also. So technology wise, great. What happened? Again, they marketed it, unfortunately, as an ultra cheap solution. And everyone wants an EchoGuard. Everyone wants, yeah. Aro, Kent Aro, that too, right? Right? Nima Malini is endorsing it. So, in fact, the Tata's are a good example here because even though we are in a Tata center, the Tata's flopped at two big products which could have had social impact. And in both cases, engineering had nothing to do with it. Engineering wise, the Nano is a marvel. Engineering wise, Tata Swatch is, for its price, an extremely good solution. But they totally misunderstood markets. And at the end of the day, that engineer. That doesn't matter. They understood markets in the entire context, which includes competition. Not just the consumer, that includes competition. You have to understand markets. And in hindsight, it's not a surprise. This is a company which has never sold directly to consumers. Tata Chemicals was usually a bulk chemicals manufacturer selling to other companies. They had no idea how to sell on a one-on-one -on -one basis to individuals at home. And they never understood that market. So defining that consumer upfront and asking who's going to leverage this as a solution is critical. Um, in terms of uh, how I recommend that you go about it, start with a very large basket of problems, of needs, not even problems and then figure out which ones you want to work on. Okay. And then you start applying filters. Because it's always convenient to start with a large number of things and start throwing out stuff rather than creating new problem statements. So are you really working on something which solves somebody's need? Are you creating a duplicate solution? Is it a big market? Notice that this question of whether it interests you or your team, I'm asking last. If you start with what can I do Unfortunately, you are immediately limited by what you will do because you come in with one skill set. Of course, next question and the most critical question is, do you have the money to pull it off? Do you, can you at least start building a solution? And the answer is, it turns out for most cases, yes. Okay. So you need to create in all of this some kind of a need specification. And here's the new specification. So this is a very critical page for you guys in terms of thinking. When I told you, if you have an idea, this is how you document your idea. This is a very structured way of looking at what you're trying to do. So think about this. What is the situation that you're trying to solve? Okay. Why is it important? If you don't have an answer to why it's important and who cares, there's probably no investor is going to come your way. That investor, by the way, could be the garment itself. It doesn't know. You don't always have to think of some corporate investor. In fact, there are three categories of investors. There's a corporate <coughs> investor. These are the ones who usually invest in startups. There's foundations of various kinds, like CSR foundations. Have you heard of CSR? Corporate social responsibility. You know that companies are mandated to give away 2% of their profits and they have to do it for a social impact. And it turns out one of the clauses in that CSR Act says that money has to be given away for innovation, which results in social impact, which means research which drives innovation can itself leverage donation funding. That's a critical thing for you to remember. So if you can make, if you can prove that what you do will end up with social impact, 
chances are you will get a donation grant you can ask for a donation grant so why is what you are working on important who cares and only then you get into solutions what are the solutions out there what exists what are the pros and cons why do you need to just why 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 are you justifying that you need to spend your time and money building another solution okay what are cost of features what features are optional features okay then you've got to list all key stakeholders and when when i say stakeholders is not simply saying who who's a competitor who's interested in your solution that could be the government could be all kinds of funding agencies could be ngos could be local businessmen who's interested in this okay sometimes the interest is positive sometimes somebody's interest is negative maybe they don't want your solution to work because your solution is going to drive them out of business or you want to create problems for them long way it's important for you to understand every the list of people who are potentially related to what you do who might either promote your solution or might interfere with your solution with marketing it later on. so upfront what's the assessment of how large the market is who are you building this for is it just again for one hospital or are you building it for 1000 hospitals who ends up using your solution what's your freedom to operate when i say freedom to operate it comes back to as if you are now competing especially with multinationals then the way multinationals usually work is any research they do immediately the file patents right now is what you are doing ripping off somebody else's patent if so if it's a small company chances are you might get away with it because the company may not have the funding to challenge you in court that you have stolen their patent but if it's a big company they'll come after you and prevent you from commercial ideas so what's your freedom to operate and having done all the r&d work if you finally come back and say that look somebody else has already filed a patent on this and i'm not allowed to commercialize at this point somebody is going to be really upset because a lot of money has been invested in a solution which cannot be commercialized so early on understanding is a freedom to operate becomes critical iit bombay for example in the r&d center here has a dedicated couple of technical officers who survey an invention disclosure so we as engineers we put up our inventions in some two page form and then very quickly a patent search gets done and we are told whether this is commercializable or not the fact that it is not the fact that somebody has patented it might still allow doesn't mean that you cannot take it forward there are things you can do for example you can make it and license it back to the original patent holder or even better you can do something slightly different and prevent that original patent from now so you you can compete you can prevent the original patent holder from doing something because you have modified it and done something here so there are ways to deal with it but usually it requires a different skill set it requires some training in intellectual property and we have started coursework here that's another thing that you can do as part of tech equip down the road getting coursework on understanding patents and how to do this how to file patents okay then at this point you come up with a conceptual design of your technology so this so if somebody has said let's build a laser based system of killing mosquitoes it's a conceptual design you're not actually build that laser and hopefully you've not been pointing that laser at mosquitoes and in the process hurting human beings as well so you can't do that r&d until a good conceptual design is signed off by everyone okay so what's the conceptual design and then finally what are the resources you need what skill sets what background students do you need what background okay prototyping labs would you need and what kinds of money would you need to leverage all of this so that's a starting statement and this is before you even put one foot in a lab okay so i'll pause how are you doing on time good yeah so we'll pause here and what i would do next is uh, now put this into context this was a very general talk what i do next is now talk about one case study in detail and we'll step through and you'll understand how some of these aspects come into play the one on cervical cancer screening <coughs>